Ma'am, unmute yourself, please. Thank you so much for telling me that. Uh, yeah, I, maybe it automatically mutes when I log out. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yes, uh, before the break, we were looking at the contrast, you know, that the Lord wishes to draw between uh, drunkenness, being drunk with wine, and being filled with the Spirit. Uh, so one thing that we saw was that perspective changes. Everything looks different. Either the person is looking at the entire world through the eyes of the wine, or that person, you know, is looking at the world through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. So depending on what has filled them, depending on what they are full of. Um, and we see that the first transformation is a harmful, destructive transformation, where that person is now becoming more and more dependent on the drink, and that is destroying them personally. It's also you know, harming all the people around them. Uh, so it destroys them. It destroys other people's lives uh, that come in contact with them. On the other hand, when we look at people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's such a positive transformation. It's such a, a transformation where the person is built up. Uh, they are they're built up, edified into something better, you know, into something uh, greater than what they were earlier. Uh, uh, because uh, not only does their life start changing, they also start becoming a blessing to those around them. So while drunkenness leads to, uh, to a lot of uh, destruction and harm, being filled with the Spirit, on the other hand, leads to uh, a very positive building up. It leads to an edification, not just of that person, but in fact, of everyone who comes in contact with them. Because through that person, even the people who come in contact start getting blessed. So uh, these two are uh, two. Um, deeply, you know, contrasting, uh, uh, you know, uh, elements that we see over here. Uh, and now, um, what happens when that person, you know, who, who was drunk, uh, when what happens once the effects of the wine wear off? You know, so the, so as long as that person was drunk, he was behaving in a certain manner. Uh, he probably thought that you know is 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 very powerful, and then he went around charging at people and doing all of that then the effect of the wine wears off. So once the effect of the wine wears off, he is no longer filled with wine. Uh, what happens? He goes back to being his whatever he was before, his normal self. So it's only as long as he was full of the wine that he got transformed into a different person. And it's the same even with being filled with the Holy Spirit. The disciples of jesus as long as they were just you know uh, not filled they were themselves but once they became filled with the holy spirit that changed and transformed them into uh, you know something better in fact you know peter is able to stand up in front of an entire crowd and say you are the people who crucified the lord i mean what a thing to say there's a large crowd standing over there uh, you know they are much larger in number than you know he and this uh, small bunch of you know uh, uh, people who are followers of jesus and uh, so boldly he's saying to all of them you know what it's you people who have crucified jesus why don't you now repent you know so uh, he becomes a different person but once the effect of that wears off, once you are no longer filled, you know, you go back to being who you are, which is why it's important to continue being filled. So a drunk person, if they want to continue, you know, in that uh, transformed um, uh, persona, they would have to continue being filled with wine so that they would continue being that other person. The same thing over here when we come to the positive uh, you know, side of this example, where we are talking about people who are filled with the spirit. You want to continue walking at a higher level, looking in, the, looking at life, looking at the world through the eyes of God. You know, you want to function at that high level. You have to continue refilling yourself with the spirit. You know, um, coming under His uh, control once again resubmitting those areas you know which uh, you have now withdrawn from him because the holy spirit is always with us right i mean he literally indwells us but he only fills up those areas where we are inviting him to come and fill us up he never forcibly pushes himself in 
where where he is not wanted that is the difference between wine and the holy spirit which is why if you look at the wording that is used it talks about people drunk in the spirit but it doesn't talk about people drunk in the holy spirit i'm, I'm so sorry it talks about people drunk in wine but it does not uh, but when it comes to over here to the parallel it does not say people who are drunk with the spirit it says people who are filled with the spirit because the thing about wine is that it forcibly takes control of the person the person makes a fool of themselves while they are drunk uh, they have no control over themselves they are doing things which they would not do if they were sober in fact uh, they are ashamed of the things which they do you know by in their drunken state once they come back to their you know to their sober state they feel ashamed of the things which they did so the drink what it did is it forcibly took over their life and it controlled them the holy spirit does not do that he waits for us to invite him to fill uh, no, uh, to fill us up only then he steps into those areas which we are opening to him so that is a choice that we choose to make on a daily basis we say lord come and fill me up in the area of finances the way i am running my you know managing my money the the way i am giving uh, you know out of my money to people uh, to ministries all of that i want you to be i want you to control me in this area lord come and fill me up in the area of my relationships then the lord begins to work you know in the area of your relationships he tells you what to do what not to do you would have to humble yourself in so many things you know with regard to relationships all of that you would do why because you are choosing you're inviting him to come and fill you up um in that area of your life and he responds to the invitation so he's not like the wine which forcibly takes over the person rather he is god and he respects our free will and so he only comes when he is invited which is why we need a refilling in the sense you know on a daily basis we may you know withdraw certain areas and no longer uh, you know leave them open for his working we kind of close off those areas so on a daily basis we go back to him and say no lord i want you to come back and fill me even in these areas i submit control to you once again you know in all of these areas so we choose to be refilled on a um a daily basis so that all those areas will continue to stay open to him for him to work for him to you know interfere if that's the term that you want to use you know where you're allowing him to say you come lord and have your say i may not like what you are saying but what you're saying will be good for me so come into this in this area as well and have your way tell me what you want me to do and i will submit to you so in that sense we allow ourselves to be filled by the spirit of god on a uh, daily basis and um, um one uh, very practical way in which we can continue to stay filled is that simple act of praying in tongues because when we are doing that uh, we are um, doing something that is not human it is something uh, you know uh, supernatural it is something that divine which is being given to us by god so when we practice this uh, you know discipline of um, praying in tongues uh, the holy spirit is able to operate in us more actively so that in fact helps in uh, enabling us to stay filled with the spirit of god so that's one way of you know staying filled uh, with the spirit of the lord so that was uh point number 1 how do you walk in the spirit you choose to stay filled the second thing we choose to stay spiritually minded now this is something so um important you know um we are all very very familiar with this verse you know we 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 are we are told right uh, don't allow your mind to be governed by the flesh allow your mind to be governed by the spirit we understand that but you know let's look at some um some very um i don't know practical aspects of this uh, so if, if we could maybe start off by actually looking at uh, romans 8 5 uh, if someone could read out for us romans chapter 8 verse 5 
Romans chapter 8 verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. So the under this, uh, you know, main point of stay spiritually minded, the first uh, sub point under being spiritually minded, the first point is set your mind on what the spirit desires. Um, now, when we look at, you know, the contrast, people who are setting their minds on what the flesh desires, um, we see that whenever this term flesh is used, you know, it could mean two things. It can just simply mean the, uh, you know, the natural flesh, the created uh, being, you know, and the, the desires that it has. For instance, one uh, desire of the flesh is, you know, to sleep. We all we all experience that desire, right? Ah, if someone is speaking, if you could mute yourself, whoever it is, um, you know, yeah, that would help. So yeah, huh? so uh, one desire of the flesh that we all experience is the desire to sleep. You know, we get tired and then we want to rest. Uh, so, but. Uh, it can also become a sinful desire, a fleshly desire in the sense we oversleep, we choose to be lazy, we choose not to fulfill our responsibilities. So there's the natural flesh, flesh desire uh, because we have all been programmed in such a way that we require sleep. So this is the desire to sleep. There's also a sinful desire to sleep where you oversleep, where you allow yourself to become lazy. And you have a whole bunch of verses in Proverbs which say that that would that would be a sinful thing, that that is a wrong thing. So um, there's the normal flesh programming, the way human beings have been programmed, the way animals have been programmed to live in a particular way in the flesh. And there's also the sinful urge which takes over, uh, where you you go beyond what is required, you know, for the flesh. And you, you know, you oversleep, you overeat, um, you know, um, rather than using anger, you know, to, to maybe defend and protect, you use anger to retaliate, to hurt. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you use what has been programmed in all the wrong ways rather than using it in the right way. So uh, what happens when a person lives like that according to what the flesh desires? You see, they are living on the level of animals. Um, have you really thought about that? See, the animals, they are programmed in a certain way, you know, in their flesh. The flesh is programmed in a certain way for them to operate, you know, at the basic level of survival. So what do most animals do? You know, they, they, they just basically, they eat, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they do whatever is required, the skills that they need, you know, for their particular survival. They try to develop those. They breed. That's about it. Uh, so that is the basic programming of the flesh. To take the example of a rat, let us say. A rat is programmed to look for food and to store the food. So the rat, the entire day, what it does is, you know, it, it keeps, you know, uh, eating. And uh, when its stomach is full, it continues to look for food. Why? Because it, it needs to store up the food. You know, for a, for a day of need. So it's always on the lookout for food and it is storing it up. And then uh, it's programmed to keep its teeth sharp. And so it's always constantly chewing on bricks, chewing on plastic, chewing on steel, chewing on whatever it can chew upon to keep those teeth sharp. That's uh, It's programmed to do that. The rat is programmed to, um, I mean, what else? Um, uh, uh, yeah, ra ra rats are programmed to be competitive. You have the dominant rats, you know, which uh, establish their superiority. And then you have the rest of the rats, you know, which kind of give in to the ones which are superior. These are all the, um, this is all the programming of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, you can say. Now, the sad thing is that humans have also started living like that. They are just following the desires of the flesh to eat to store up, you know, to collect, to gather, to you know, prove their superiority by through the material things that they have, uh, through the power that they can exert. Uh, all of these things, if you look, the humans today are operating literally at the level of animals. But 
the difference between animals and humans is that humans were supposed to be created in the image of God. You see, they were created for higher things. They were supposed to desire things which uh, a, a spirit being desires. Animals are just animals. You know, they have a fleshly programming and they are programmed to live at the basic level of just existence and survival. Yes, they relate and connect with each other to some extent. They feel uh, emotions to a certain extent, but they are not spirit beings. We were created for higher things. And so Adam and Eve, when they were originally created, they weren't just operating at the level of the, uh, the, other, or the rest of the species, or, you know, the rest of the animals. They were not just simply thinking about, you know, collecting food, uh, you know, sharpening their skills for survival. Um, that was not the thing. They were thinking in terms of relating with God. God would walk with them in the cool of the evening. You know, they would be relating with him. They were meant to be living at a very much higher level because they were created in the image of God. But then when that connection between God and humans was broken because, you know, Adam and Eve chose uh, sin, they went into sin. That divine connection was broken because spiritually they died. The spirit within them died. It became a spiritually dead spirit. It, it could no longer understand spiritual things. It no longer desired spiritual things. And so because of that, um, you know, people became spiritually dead and they began to operate at the level of animals. So this is what happens with us. You know, um, uh, most people, if you look at them, there is a desire somewhere inside them for spiritual things, you know, which is why that they, they go in for meditation. They, 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 they try to, you know, uh, do good to people because that makes them feel better. So they're, they're trying to reach uh, reach out because this is inner urge inside them for something higher, something better. But most of the time, they are just engaged in operating at the level of animals. Just what your flesh is programmed for. You know, whatever your flesh needs, you just do that. And even if it means breaking the rules of God, you just go ahead and do that because the flesh is asking for it. You just want to give it what the flesh wants. And so when a believer becomes, you know, a Christian, they become a follower of the Lord Jesus. Their unrenewed mind continues to operate at that level of fulfilling the desires of the flesh. The unrenewed mind is still thinking in terms of, okay, okay, how do I survive? How do I lift myself up? How do I, you know, prove myself superior to others? How do I gather more than what others have gathered? Just in the, uh, the that's at the le animal level. But we need to start renewing our minds where we start looking at scripture and realizing that we are called to something higher, something better. We are meant to walk at a much superior level to the animals. So we start renewing our mind and we start you know, working. Um, so when we start renewing our mind, our inner person starts being strengthened in spiritual things. We start deepening our connection with the Lord. And then we begin to operate the way Adam and Eve were actually originally meant to operate, which is why over here when it says, you know, don't be like the people whose minds have been set on what the flesh desires. Rather, have minds that are set on what the spirit desires. God is saying, come back to what you were originally meant to be, what you were originally created for. You were created in the image of God to have a personal relationship with me, to walk with me in the cool of the evening, you know, like it says in, the gen in Genesis. You were meant to be in relationship with me. So we are being lifted up to what we originally were supposed to be. So we don't need to be like the unbelievers who are functioning at the animal level. We are meant to be uh, at a superior level where because we are connected with the Lord, we start thinking the way he does. Our focus is not on just you know collecting and holding and satisfying our physical needs and uh, just you know proving our dominance over others and no we are able to move to higher level things when we choose to uh, desire the things of the spirit. We choose to start behaving like people who are made in the image of God rather than just being like the rest of the animal species. You know, so, so it is so important for us to understand this. We are, uh, you know, uh, we are being called 
to live at a higher level the way adam and eve were originally created you know to live so um, one important aspect of staying spiritually minded is we are very very conscious of this we choose to set our minds on what the spirit desires we choose not to be like the animals which are just programmed to fulfill their uh, whatever the flesh is asking for that is a very basic low level of existence and we are called for something higher the next thing that we need to keep in mind regarding you know staying spiritually minded we choose not to displease the holy spirit because that's the basic meaning of that word over there you know the word grieve um let's actually look at that passage um you know about not displeasing the holy spirit um ephesians chapter 4 verses 29 to 31 if someone could please read out ephesians 4 29 to 31 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 to 31 Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the holy spirit of god with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption get rid of all the bitterness rage anger brawling and, sl- and slander along with every form of malice If we look at the context of this passage it's talking about relationships the way we you know treat each other so it says you know in in verse 29 it says you know only speak things which will build other people up only speak things which will be helpful for the needs of others you know so speak such things and then if you look at verse 31 it says you know give up bitterness that you have against each other rage and anger you know keep them under control you know don't give in to such things so in the context you know in the context of these things it says do not grieve the holy spirit of god so uh, if we look at the context of this commandment that is given about not grieving the holy spirit we realize that over here we are it's talking in terms of our relationships in the way we choose to relate with other believers uh, so that word which is used over there that greek word which is used for grieve that's the word lupeo okay so um that word lupeo is used in many places you know in the new testament and um, the main meaning which we get from that word would be um you know an unhappy feeling uh, so um it's it, it's 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 a mixture of um, feeling sad about something and it's also a feeling of you know disapproval where you don't approve of what is happening to use a very good example uh, you know matthew chapter 18 verse 31 where this very same word is being used that's the word lupeo which is being used even in matthew 18 31 If someone could read out for us Matthew eighteen thirty one, please. Matthew eighteen thirty one. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Okay, this is the very same word that is being used about you know, you know not grieving. So over here in this verse, they're saying don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But over here in Matthew eighteen thirty one, they translate the word as outraged. Um, and then you have an oh whole bunch of other places where you know the English translates translates the word as distressed. Um, um, so you have different words which are English words which are used to describe this one single word, uh, and Uh, so over here if you look at this particular example uh, this is the you know the the story of the unforgiving servant um, he was forgiven by you know his uh, ruler or master yeah he was forgiven by his master but when he has to forgive someone else he doesn't do that even though he has received kindness and mercy at the hands of his master he does not extend that same kindness and mercy to uh, the other person and so when the others see what is happening you know they experience this feeling called lupeo in the first place they are kind of sad for what has been done to this poor man who's been thrown in prison you know so they feel sad about this this uh, wrong which has been done to him and also there's this indignation 
way they think injustice has been done it's wrong what has been done to this person is wrong and justice should be done so this anger this disapproval there's also the sadness that something bad has been done to someone you know so it's a mixture of these feelings um, and um, uh, so uh, when it says over here do not you know lupeo the holy spirit it is saying don't do something you know which would uh, which he would disapprove of you know in the same way the servants disapproved of what this man had done and also you know don't grieve him in the sense don't grieve the holy spirit in the sense don't do something you know which makes him feel sad uh, about the way you have treated someone uh, so if i am speaking words you know which are hurtful which are tearing down a person the holy spirit he feels lupeo he is saddened that i am tearing down someone's life and he he strongly disapproves of what i am doing because that is not how he has treated me those are not the kind of words he spoke to me he has always spoken words of encouragement to me but now here i am going to another believer and tearing them down so lupeo has got two senses it expresses the disapproval you know it expresses anger that a person is doing something that is wrong at the same time it also expresses a sadness that um that something uh, unjust unfair is being done to a person so in that sense we should not lupeo the holy spirit we should not grieve the holy spirit we must conduct ourselves in our relationships in such a way that the holy spirit is pleased he is happy we must be people who are building up others edifying others uh, and uh, we uh, must be people who are doing justice who are fair in our dealings with people uh, so um how uh, so one important way that we choose to walk in the spirit is in the area of relationships with this really no choice we are we have to be people who are uh, a blessing to others we cannot live in strife with others we cannot be people who are you know gossiping about people behind their backs no that would most definitely grieve the holy spirit he would disapprove he would be angry with what we are doing and he would be saddened that we would be treating someone in that manner so you know that uh, so this is something uh, that is very important in walking in the spirit we would have to be very careful about our conduct uh, you know in um, when it comes to other believers and in fact even unbelievers how are we treating them another thing that to keep in mind about staying spiritually minded you know we should be careful not to quench the holy spirit now this term is used in first thessalonians 5 verses 18 to 20 so if someone could please read out first thessalonians 5 18 to 20 first thessalonians chapter 5 Eighteen to twenty, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here, if you look at the overall context, it's talking about our attitude towards God. Is it an attitude of trust, where you really trust Him? or is it an attitude where you doubt him where you are angry with him where you are upset with him because you see when circumstances are not going well do you still trust him so much that you are giving thanks it says over here you know in in verse 18 give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you so do you still trust him that he has permitted this that he has allowed this only because he knows how to work bring some good out of it are you willing to trust him and you know to that to the extent where you still are thanking him in the same way verse 20 where it says you know uh, do not treat prophecies with contempt you know the lord is giving you a word of prophecy saying you know this is what i will do for you and are you one of those people who say ha huh, no way is this going to happen yeah yeah when when it actually happens then i will believe so are you treating what he is you know saying to you with contempt 
or are you trusting him and saying yes lord even though it seems so impossible i choose to believe what you are saying to me i choose to trust you so it's this whole attitude of trust it's this whole attitude of believing that he is good that he has the best you know in his heart for us um now people who don't have this attitude what they are doing is they are you know uh, that greek word over there it it is spedu sped i don't even know how to pronounce it it's s b e okay it's like spe spe spenumi okay so s b e n n u m i that's the greek word and uh, that word is you know that that's the word you know which is translated in in english as quench and uh, in most places where this particular word is used in the new testament it's talking about you know extinguishing a fire there's a flame burning and then you extinguish it you put it out uh, so um, it's like as if you know god is saying have this attitude of trust have this attitude where even when things are not going well you choose to be what i am saying you choose to believe that i am good you choose to believe that i am acting on your behalf you have the simple attitude of childlike trust in me because when you refuse to have that kind of an attitude and you grow bitter or you doubt me or in fact you i know you you treat my word with contempt when you do such things it it extinguishes the flame it's like the holy spirit is you no know, burning brightly in our lives he is doing amazing things in our lives but when we stop trusting in god when we start uh, being very contemptuous you know in our attitude uh, towards the things of god and we don't really believe him and we're thinking look the other family look at the way he you know he blesses them but when it comes to our family and our prayer request he's not responding you know so all these wrong attitudes it puts out the fire it extinguishes the fire it quenches the fire so over here it is basically saying you know do not um you know extinguish this flame the fire that is burning brightly the holy holy spirit who is doing his work you know in you in a, in a beautiful manner allow that flame to get brighter and brighter let his working in your life grow stronger and stronger because you are being very very careful not to put out the fire you're being very very careful not to extinguish the work which is going on you know in your life so we are asked uh, to how do we stay spiritually minded we choose to trust him we choose to believe in him we choose not to grow negative in our thinking and attitude towards the lord um another thing uh, that is very important about staying spiritually minded we choose not to resist the holy spirit uh, that is a uh, you know that verse actually is in the uh, is in stephen's speech you know which he gives before he is martyred uh, so um, that's basically where we find the uh, wording so maybe we can look at acts chapter 7 verses 51 to 53 now if someone could please read out acts 7 51 to 53 Acts chapter seven was fifty one to fifty three. You stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there even ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. okay so over here uh, when it talks about you know not resisting the holy spirit it's mainly basically saying don't be stiff necked now this is a term which is used in the old testament many times it's a it's a metaphor that uh, the you know people in biblical times were very very familiar with um, basically if a person you know is willing to bow down their head uh, it it means it's an attitude of submission where you are willing to learn and where you are living to accept correction where you are willing to be taught so bending the head is like an act of submission it's an act of obedience it uh, so on the other hand if you're holding your head up straight and saying no i will not bend then you are being stiff necked 
in that sense. So stiff neckedness, you can say, is basically uh, you know uh, an act of rebellion. It's an act of saying, no, I will not receive correction. No, I will not listen to what you are saying. I will not obey. It's 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 this it's this uh, whole attitude of disobedience and uh, distrust and rebellion. You know, that's that's the kind of um, uh, that, that that is a stiff necked attitude. So over here, you know, Stephen in a speech, he says, you are people who have always been stiff necked. Uh, he says, you know, the law which you people received, it was given through angels, you know, at Mount Sinai, when God comes down in all of his glory. And there was a whole lot of things that happened in the spiritual realm by the law, while, you know, while the Mosaic law was being given to them. So even though the law was given to you in such a spectacular manner, you have not obeyed it because you are a stiff necked people. You are people who have always resisted the Holy Spirit. So one way that we can really make sure that we, we are, that we do not you know, resist the Holy Spirit is we choose to be people who are willing to bow the head in the sense we say, yes, Lord, what you are telling me to do, I choose to obey it. That word of correction that you are giving, yes, Lord, I am willing to receive it and act upon it. Um, so that makes us a people who are not resisting, but rather submitting and obeying and trusting the, uh, the Holy Spirit. So uh, these are some of the things that we would need to keep in mind if we wish to stay spiritually minded. So staying filled with the Spirit, staying spiritually minded, these are two ways that we can make sure that we are walking in the Spirit on a daily basis. Another way that we can walk in the Holy Spirit is by asking for his help. I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, in, your, in your notes, the example that is used over there is about the you know flesh rising up in anger, the flesh rising up in irritation. So at that time, uh, it's not something that we, these are not emotions that we can deal with on our, on our own. So we choose to reach out to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, you help me. You help me to respond in the right manner. And so even as we do that, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit gives us his fruit. He gives us the fruit uh, you know, uh, to be able to, um, to respond in the correct way. In the same way, when we are facing very diff difficult challenges and the storms are very, very violent, and we wonder whether our whole, whether our whole family you know, will just drown in the kind of circumstances that we are facing at that time, we need to call out to the Holy Spirit, ask him for his help and say, Lord, you know how to deal with the situation. So you give us this attitude of calm trust where we just look to you, where we keep our eyes focused on you so that you can do your work in the situation. So in our times of need, we cry out to the Holy Spirit to, for, for his help. And then we, re uh, we receive divine, uh, supernatural help you know, something that we could never have done for ourselves, God does it for us. And that is why it says in Romans 8.26, yeah, if someone could read out Romans 8.26. Yeah, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. It says over here that it's the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weakness. So we go, we go to him, we cry out to him, we say, Lord, I cannot you know, obey this particular thing on my own, or I cannot face this difficult uh, trial on my own. You know, you you help me. So when we cry out to him and we reach out to him for help, it says that he intercedes on our behalf. So uh, uh, he is the one who who makes it possible for us to overcome that particular situation. So he empowers us. Uh, so uh, the third way that we choose to walk in the spirit is we depend upon him for his help. We cry out to him in our, in our time of need. And when we do that, he will intercede for us and he will empower us. The fourth way, uh, you know, which we have already actually looked at all uh, before is basically speaking out the word of God. Uh, so if we choose to place our faith, you know, in the word of God, and if we choose to 
um, practice what the word of God says, that is equal to you know using the sword of the spirit. Um, because you know Isaiah 55, 11, this is what it says about the word of God. Uh, yeah, if someone could read out Isaiah 55, 11. Isaiah 55, 11. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Amen. So because the word of God is powerful in this way, it is it was able to accomplish what it desires. It is able to achieve the purpose for which it has been sent forth. Therefore, we use the word of God as a sword. So the Holy Spirit gives us the right word for that particular situation and we declare it, we proclaim it. That becomes the, the, the word of our testimony. So we overcome that situation by the word which has been given. Why? Because when we proclaim that word in confidence, when we stand upon it you know, and act and obey, when we do that, that word which we have released by faith, it will actually go forth. It will accomplish the purpose for which God, first of all, gave it to us. So the sword of the spirit becomes very powerful. Um, we, we choose to believe it. We choose to practice it. We choose to declare it. And even as we are doing that, that word actually goes forth. It's a living word, right? It says the word, the word of God is spirit and life. So it's not just a bunch of words. It is something living. So it goes forth and it accomplishes the purpose for which you know the Holy Spirit gave us that word. Uh, so that is why uh, we, we can walk in the spirit by speaking out his word. Now, uh, the next uh, portion in your notes is talking about how do I know if I am walking in the spirit? Yes, I have understood the importance of walking in the spirit. It's something that I desire. It's something that I want to do. But how do I know if I'm actually doing that? Am I walking in the spirit today or not? How can I know? So there are some basic uh, things which will help us to know whether we are actually walking in the spirit or not. The first thing is rather obvious. You know, if we are walking in the spirit, uh, we will not see the fruit of the flesh coming out of us. Rather, we will see the fruit of the spirit coming out of us. You know, that that's explained, right? We have a detailed list in Galatians chapter 5. Um, Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21 will give a detailed list of all the, you know, the acts of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh. You know, uh, you have immorality and you have hatred. There is jealousy. Uh, there's drunkenness. There's all kinds of things mentioned in that list. So if I see those things coming out of my life on a day to day basis, then that's a very clear indication that I'm not walking in the spirit. On the other hand, if I look at my life on a daily basis and I see love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and those things coming out of my life, then I will realize, oh, OK, I think I'm actually walking in the spirit because I see this kind of fruit coming out of my life. So the fruit manifesting out of our life will automatically show us whether or not we are walking in the spirit. Uh, another uh, thing, obviously, will be um, am I someone who is edifying others? Am I being a blessing to them? Uh, so if I find myself to be someone who is always speaking words of encouragement and building up people, then I can be confident that I am walking in the spirit. Uh, so the scripture that is given in your notes you know, for this particular point, uh, it's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Uh, if someone could please read out Ephesians 5, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. OK, so here it says that we are supposed to speak to each other in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Um, it sounds very strange. How do you go talking to people in psalms and hymns? You know, It does not quite make sense. Uh, the uh, and the same thing again is repeated again in Colossians three sixteen. In Colossians three sixteen, it says, you know, um, uh, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish 
one another with all wisdom. How are you going to teach and admonish one another with all wisdom? Through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. The same thing, same wording is used in both the places. And we are supposed to use these psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit to teach each other, to you know, warn each other in case you know we are going off in the wrong way. So basically, it's saying, you know, use these psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit to to edify each other, to keep encouraging each other to walk in the Lord, you know, to teach one another the ways of God. Uh, so uh, the basic explanation is that in those days, you know, uh, they didn't have uh, uh, written material. So basically, they would memorize a lot of things. And it's always easier to memorize something which is in the form of a song or which is in the form of poetry. Because of the rhythm that is there in the words, you're able to remember, you're able to by heart it more easily, and you're able to remember it more easily. So in those days, almost all teachings would be converted into a psalm or a hymn, you know, or a song. And the Holy Spirit would help them to, you know, develop these songs and hymns and all that. So they would they would remind each other of these psalms and hymns, and they would, you know, encourage each other to walk in the ways of God. Today we don't really do that much. In fact, even our old hymns, you know, used to have a lot of rich teaching and doctrine in them. But our current worship songs uh, don't really have much teaching content in them. So we probably would not be using our uh, songs to teach each other. But instead, today we have, you know, sermons. We have books which have been written. We have these uh, wonderful discussions and debates, you know, uh, um, uh, videos which which are discussing certain topics where different people present their views, you know, of that particular topic. So we have all these other things now. So probably today we would be using those things to teach each other and admonish each other, like it says over here. So if I find myself doing that, talking about spiritual things saying things which will be will which will build up other people if i find myself you know see, you know if if uh, if these are the kind of things coming out of my mouth that is evidence that i am walking in the spirit you know so uh, that is another indication that i am walking in the spirit and then there are another two things mentioned over here in your notes uh, people who are walking in communion with the lord you know constantly they are in they are connected to him they have this attitude of 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 gratitude, uh, you know, where they are always, you know, thankful to him, where they are always trusting him. So, if a person who is walking in that kind of a communion with the Lord, that's a very clear indication that they are walking in the Spirit. And of course, also people who are walking in humility and submission that shows that they have the uh, right attitude that they are walking in the Spirit. And uh, Ephesians five twenty. 21 is the verse that is given for that. Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then the next few verses after that, you know, go on to explain the different kinds of submission. It talks about submission in a marriage relationship. It talks about submission in a parent, uh, you know, uh, parent and child relationship. It talks about submission in a master and employee relationship. So the opening line is basically Ephesians 5.21, where it says, submit to one another. And then it goes on to explain how different people submit in different situations and different scenarios. Uh, so someone who is walking in submission and humility, uh, putting other people's interests before their own interests, that is a clear indication that the person is walking in the spirit. Okay, So these are all the things that um, uh, we need to keep in mind so that we are actually walking in the spirit on a daily basis. Because when we do that, we are able to walk in victory. The fruit of the spirit literally automatically comes out of our lives. And we will be able to overcome the temptations and challenges that we face because the uh, Holy Spirit empowers us. OK, so. Um, yeah, so those are, those are just some thoughts that we you know, were able to reflect upon uh, regarding this particular aspect of living an overcoming life. Uh, so we'll close with a word of prayer because we are like out of time. Lord, we just thank you so much for the learnings that we had today. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have given your written word to us so that we can use it to live an overcoming life. So I pray that we will make a conscious effort to to spend time in your presence, 
uh, to hear from you, to meditate upon you, uh, and and learn the things that you are trying to impart to us through your word. So we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you would enable us to use the word of God uh, to live an overcoming life. Also, we pray that you would help us to walk in your spirit on a daily basis. Help us, O oh Lord, to make a conscious choice to stay in step with your spirit so that we, we can live by the spirit, by the power of your spirit, by your enabling. So we pray that, Lord, you would um, that you would enable us to actually practice these two things in our lives so that we can enjoy uh, victory uh, in, in different situations and circumstances. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for staying till the end. And uh, we'll meet again next class. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.